What we want to do is look at seven Bible passages. We shall look at the first one again at the end. But we want to ask a question and answer them just from these seven Bible passages. And in a way, it's the most fundamental question that we can ask. You see, when we talk about good news, <coughs> we need good news. The Bible is full of good news. The Bible tells us lots of very straight things about ourselves, but it is full of God's answer for our problems. So let's start in Galatians chapter 3. And the question will arise easily enough from that passage. Now, Galatians chapter 3 is dealing with the question of the promise that God has made. And the good news that's involved in it. And I shall show you in a moment where that fits in to Galatians chapter 3, verse 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, <coughs> preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Now, there's a lot of things in that verse. <laughs> First of all, it mentions the scripture. So what we know as the Old Testament, or perhaps more correctly, the Hebrew scriptures, contain within it, says verse 8, a teaching. Here's the teaching. Foreseeing that God would justify the nations. So the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, says the Apostle Paul, contain within it, contain within it, the teaching that God is going to justify people. Of course, when he speaks of heathen or nations, he's speaking of non-Jewish people. God's dealings in the Old Testament were mainly, although not exclusively, with those of Abraham's descent, the Jews, the people of Israel. But even there then, says the Apostle, within that Old Testament, there was a teaching that God is going to justify or make right with him people of other nations. And the teaching of the Bible is that we are not all naturally right with God. As a matter of fact, the teaching of the Bible is, of course, that we are naturally at wrong with God. And we need to be made right with him in some way. He needs to view us as right with him if we can be with him, which is actually his desire. And that's part of what the good news is about. So look again at verse 8. God has promised that he would make right people of non-Jewish origin through faith, belief in him, and has preached before the gospel unto Abraham. Now this word gospel, of course it's the phrase that means good news. So there is good news which was preached to Abraham. And Abraham is an Old Testament character. He's there in the book of Genesis, as we shall see in a moment. And so that there was preached, saying, in thee all nations shall be blessed. The point being that not just the Jewish nation would be blessed or brought happiness, but that all nations in some way, because of Abraham, as a matter of fact, it says, in thee all nations shall be blessed. So we've seen that there is the idea of gospel. We've seen that that's really about good news. And we've got a question. And the question is, verse 8 says that the gospel was preached to Abraham. The good news was, now we think of the gospel as a New Testament teaching. Something that's in the mouth of Jesus and his apostles. So how then was this gospel preached to Abraham? And that's the basic question that we're going to try to answer. And we shall come back to Galatians 3 at the very end. So, of course, we need to go back to think of Abraham at the beginning. So, Genesis chapter 12. And just see the teaching that we have there. So, here's the same Abraham that we just read of in Galatians 3 verse 8. And Galatians 12 tells us about Abraham. Verse 1 says that God had said to Abraham, same person, with a slightly different name at an earlier stage of his journey. And Abraham had to leave his country, 
and his family in verse 1, and then in verse 2, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So, verse 2, you, Abraham, are going to become a great nation, and I'm going to bless you. Verse 3, I will bless him who blesses you, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now, there's the interesting point, that what was said in Galatians 3, all nations will be blessed in you. Well, clearly, it's taken up from this very passage. But there is a point here. In you shall all families of the earth be blessed. There is the beginning here of what we might call a seed promise. We're going to see this idea again, but when the Bible talks of seeds, it has something very specific in mind. You see, I have a packet of seeds. If you were to sow this particular packet of seeds, well, if you sow the packet, nothing would happen except to go moldy. But if, if you take the seeds out, uh, then I believe, with my advanced uh, botanical knowledge, uh, horticultural knowledge indeed, you would get carrots. At least that's the picture on the front. I know that much. Yeah. The precise process involved in what you do more than that, I would struggle with, but I get that idea. And here's the point, that the word seed that we have in the Bible, and we shall come across it in a moment, is the same word that we have in Genesis chapter 1, when God produces seed-bearing plants. His purpose is involved with seeds that bring forth fruit. And when he talks of people, he talks of them as seed because, well, it's part of his purpose that seeds are planted and they bring forth fruit. That's part of what he wants to do. And in you, Abraham, all families are going to be blessed through you. Through your seed is the phrase that we shall come on, we'll come to. So just bear that in mind. There's the first of a series of promises that God makes. And he says that all nations are to be involved in that blessing. Not just Abraham's family, who became in due course the Jewish nation of Israel, but all nations are to be blessed. So even we, in this far-off generation and long-lost time, could come within the scope of that promise, because it's all nations. And to be blessed, well, it has the idea of being made happy at its root. And there's a great deal more to that, as we shall see. Now, if you come across in Genesis to chapter 15, just see that the point that's being made there. So we're at a, a later stage of Abraham's journey of faith. And in Genesis 15, verse 5, God brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven. And he said, tell the stars if thou be able to number them. So here, here is Abraham being brought out into perhaps, perhaps looking up at the night sky. And, and you know when you've done that and there's no light pollution and you can look around and see the multitude of stars that are there. And God says to Abraham, you number those stars. You try. And you lose count fairly soon. Uh, well, I, I lose count very soon, but that's a, an entirely different matter. But that's the nature of the scope of the promises that I'm making to you. That your descendants, I, I didn't finish verse, uh, the verse, did I? Look at it, verse 5. So shall thy seed be. Do you see the point? There is a seed promise. You, Abraham, are going to be like the plants that God planted in Genesis chapter 1, that are her bearing seed, are able to produce a great offspring, a great crop, a great fruit for God. Well, that's, Abraham, what you're going to be. I have made this promise. And Abraham believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. God counted it to him for righteousness. Do you remember, we started off in Galatians 3 reading that God was going to justify the nations through faith, make right people with God 
through faith, through belief in him. And verse 6 says that Abraham believed what God had said. There's the very essence of what God is looking for. It's people who are prepared to believe what he says. That what God says he will do, he will do. The New Testament says that Abraham was fully persuaded that God, what God had promised, he would perform. When God said something, Abraham said, I believe he will do it. However unlikely it might look. And that's why God counted it to him for righteousness. God looked at Abraham and viewed him as right with him. Not that Abraham was a perfect man any more than you or I are perfect, but he was a man who believed God. He was, the scriptures record, an upright man, not a flawless man. So, first of all then, we see in verse 5 that Abraham was promised a multitude, a family, a seed. So shall thy seed be, as many as the stars. But God went on, didn't he? He said... I brought thee out to give thee this land, that's uh, in verse 7, to give thee this land. And that is a land promise. Now here's the point. There is in the Bible, in the, we find the seed promise, and we also find that there is a land promise. And this is what we must remember as we read through these promises. Both of these elements are here and this is absolutely critical. This is slightly, slightly beyond what scripture is saying, but the logic is there in a certain sense and we shall come to this. If you have seeds, you have to have somewhere to plant the seeds, fairly obviously, even I appreciate that. And when we read these things, just notice how these two things come together. You never have seeds on their own. You never have land on its own. Seeds without land would not grow, and land without seeds would not produce fruit. And God's desire is to produce fruit to his glory. And you'll see what I mean by that in due course. I'm going to just put them there because they helpfully remind me what this is all about. Okay, so seeds and land. Now let's go to the New Testament, to Matthew chapter 1. And this is where the Lord Jesus Christ comes into the picture. Now, in Matthew chapter 1, we have the appearance of the angel Gabriel to Mary, who was to be the mother of Jesus. Uh, except here in verse 20, actually, it's to, it's to Joseph, of course, who was to be Mary's husband, but had not, they had not yet come together, it says. And verse 21, the angel says, She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He shall save his people from their sins. You know he said that God's purpose was to make right people of all nations with him. The reason that people are not naturally right with him is because the Bible says we are sinners, we do the wrong thing and we need to be saved. From sin and from death. And that's what Jesus was going to do, says the angel, to save us from our sins. So part of God's purpose revealed in Galatians chapter 3, of which the Old Testament spoke, part of that purpose was to do with the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He shall save his people. Now you see, God's purpose is with people. He started off with Abraham and he selected him, but his purpose was never restricted just to Abraham or even to his family or even to the Jewish nation. It was, we know, Galatians 3 told us, with all nations. And so the seed promise, can you see, is here too. He shall save his people in you and in your seed. There is the seed promise in the lips of the angel. But there is more. Have a look at verse 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So the seed who was promised to Abraham, through whom was going, God was going to fulfil his purpose to make people of all nations right with him, the ultimate descendant, the ultimate seed, is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He, he's going to be the end result of that process. That's what verse 1 is telling us. That's why you can't get beyond the very first verse of the first chapter of the New Testament without making a connection between Jesus and Abraham. It's clearly <laughs> absolutely fundamental. And there's more in that verse, by the way. Did you notice in Matthew 1, just to go back to verse 21, he shall save his people. That's the answer to a question, an unasked question almost, but we could ask it. Look again at verse 21. Thou shalt bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus for. And the word for means because, for this reason. So if we said, well, why was Jesus called Jesus? Well, it's for this reason, because he shall save his people from their sins. Names in the Bible we know are significant. They have meaning. And here is Jesus' name being defined for us by the angel Gabriel. That God's very own name has been put into the name of Jesus. In the Hebrew, it's Yahshua, isn't it? He who will save his people from their sins. That's how God is going to do it. And through him, he's going to bring salvation to his people, those who believe in him. That's why we can read in Acts chapter 4, for example, that there is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved other than through this one, the Lord Jesus, the seed of Abraham, the one who was going to bring salvation to those who believed what God had said, the one who could make us right with him in that way. Now then, let's go to Luke. We had the words of the angel Gabriel to Joseph. Now let's see his words to Mary. And in these chapters, we find that mighty angel associated with the work of salvation, with God's work in Jesus, the, the, this mighty angel Gabriel, revealing God's purpose to she who was to be the mother of Jesus. Luke chapter 1, verse 33. And he, Jesus, shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Uh, I'm sorry, I should have started at verse 31. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. Now, there's the same teaching that we had in Matthew chapter 1. His name will be called Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So he's going to be this son, is to be called Jesus. But this time, look where the emphasis is. What's the nature of the promise that's being given to this mother of Jesus? The throne of his father and the house of his kingdom. If we were to say, well, there were two types of promise. One was a land promise and one was a seed <coughs> a seed promise, which of those two would it be? It's a land promise, isn't it? He's going to reign over the house of Israel, the house of Jacob, we read, and he's going to be, he's going to be given the thrones at the end of verse 32 of his father David and of his kingdom in verse 33. This is a land promise. So isn't that interesting that in the words of the angel Gabriel to Joseph, we had a seed promise. And here in the words to Mary, we have a land promise because the land and the seed promise go together. They are part of God's inseparable purpose. And we shall see why in a moment. So in Luke chapter one, you can see that we have an emphasis on the land promise. Now come to verse 55. And just notice now this is a wonderful response to those words that Mary has just heard and she gives this wonderful testimony of her understanding of what has just been said to her and of what it's all about and verse 55 the purpose of the coming of Jesus the son is as he spake to our fathers to Abraham and to his seed forevermore so there is Abraham mentioned again that this coming this son who is to come is a fulfilment, Mary understands, of the promise given so long ago to Abraham that we read of in Genesis 12 and Genesis 15. And she's yet more explicit, uh, sorry, yet more explicit is the passage 
as we continue. You, you just notice uh, the end of verse 55 mentions, and to his seed forevermore. The, the first aspect of the promise is to Abraham's natural descendants, the Jewish people of Israel, although clearly, as we said, it goes further to all nations. But come on to verse 68, because here is the mouth in the mouth of another faithful man at this time. Here's Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, who comes to understand the purpose of all of these things, and particularly now with the birth of John the Baptist. Luke chapter 1, verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. And it's quite remarkable if you come down to verse 37, uh, sorry, 77, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Here's salvation of his people. This is the message that was preached to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1. And Zacharias understands it. And the terms in which he's expressing it, I know I've only just summarised that passage, but what he's saying is this, salvation is coming through the seed. This is how salvation is coming. The one who is the descendant, the seed of Abraham, is to bring it. And the salvation promised comes through the seed. So what we have then is, again, the land promise and the seed promise are inextricably linked. And they all go back to Abraham, who was given a promise of seed and a promise of land. And we can now begin to understand the nature of what those promises were really talking about. The nature of salvation through the seed and the promise of land, which was linked up with the kingdom. Because remember, we read in the words of the angel, to Mary, that Jesus was to sit on the throne of David, which was a land promise. And those two elements had been there in the promises to Abraham, a seed promise and a land promise. Can you see the remarkable consistency that there is in the Bible? Old and New Testaments makes no difference. The purpose of God is the same, and it's revealed as the same. And the New Testament is adding to our understanding of how that promise is going to be fulfilled. Acts chapter 3 then takes our understanding a little further. Now Acts chapter 3 of course is after the Lord Jesus Christ has lived and been crucified and been raised from the dead, never to die again. The first man to be brought out the grave and given immortality, never to die again. And then, of course, he went to heaven. And Acts chapter 3 is dealing with what happened after that. In fact, it's the words of his apostle Peter to the people of Israel. Now, let's read verse 15. You killed the prince of life, he says, whom God has raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. He says, you killed him, but we disciples of him, we knew him. We were with him for three and a half years and we saw him dead. Well, Certainly those women went to the tomb, didn't they, and saw his, bury, his body being buried there. But we saw him again. He was raised from the dead. The apostle was able to say in 1 Corinthians 15, there were over 500 people who saw him together at one time. It, it wasn't made up. It wasn't a dream. It really happened. And so verse 19 of Acts chapter 3. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Remember, he's speaking to a nation who's just coming to terms with the reality that they have killed God's appointed Messiah for them. The, the anointed one who is to be their king, that God chose, they just killed. So here are some sins to be repented of, to be thought differently about, to be sorry for. And why? Why should they be repenting and thinking differently? That your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Here is an opportunity for people who are recognising and acknowledging they've done the wrong thing, for those sins to be blotted out, obscured, 
right away, to use language from other places in the Bible, as though they'd never been. As far as the east is from the west, he has removed our transgressions from us, says the psalmist. Because as great as God is, as high as the heaven is from the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. That's the God we deal with. And in his mercy, he's caused us to know these things. And here is a lesson that starts with Abraham's natural descendants, the Jews, but the principles of which extend to people in every generation. So there's the beginning that God has enabled you to have your sins blotted out. Just read the end of, of that little phrase there chapter, uh, in verse 25 just at the end of the chapter, you are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Do you remember that? That was right back there in Genesis. In your seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Well, now he says in verse 26, unto you first, the Jews, God has raised up his son Jesus and sent him to bless you. How? Has that blessing come about then? A blessing was promised to Abraham, to you and to your seed. How did that blessing come about? In what form? He says in verse 26, in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. In the blotting out of sin that we read of earlier. So here is a seed promise. It's about people who are being made right with God through the forgiveness of their sin by the seed that was promised to Abraham. And so this seed promise is all about salvation through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> that there might be people who were rich in fruitfulness for him. People whose lives would never be the same again. Can you imagine if you were one of those people who'd been in Israel at the time of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and you suddenly understood what you had done. You put the first and only sinless man who had ever lived to death. And when you understood that, that's why it says in Acts chapter 2 that they were pricked in their hearts. Their consciences were absolutely in a mess now. But they didn't have to stay that way. God is saying to them and to us that you can be forgiven. You can be made right with God through the work of this Lord Jesus Christ. In actual fact, through the death, of course, and his resurrection that he had suffered. So there's a seed promise that brings to blessing and salvation to those who trust him. Just note verse 15, Acts 3 verse 15 again, you killed the prince of life. That's what he is. As a matter of fact, it's the same word that in Hebrews is translated the author of life. He's the one who is bringing life to others. We in the darkness and the hopelessness of our natural life, says the Bible, for whom death is just a matter of time, he can bring life. He is as the author of life through, says the Bible, forgiveness of sins, a blessing which came to Jews first, but was to be extended to every nation you remember. Now, at this point, just think about this question then. I started off by saying, well, there is the seed promise and there is the land promise. We just talked about salvation and forgiveness of sins, which is wonderful. Without which we cannot come to God. And through the work of Jesus, we can approach to God. We can address him as our father. We can think of Jesus as our saviour. And might we not stop there then? Might we not say, well, that surely is the very essence of the good news of the gospel, which the New Testament teaches. And many people would say that. That's, that's sure of the heart of the gospel. But then you see, all you'd have is seeds then. And seeds on their own don't produce fruit. They have to go somewhere. And the analogy is this, that it is no good to talk of salvation without understanding how salvation takes place, is it? It is not a question of wonderful as our life is now and can be in the Lord Jesus. That's not the end. It's not just the fact that we can approach to God as the Father through Jesus. That's not the end of salvation because wonderful as that is, while our life lasts, but one day the Bible says all of us, unless something very dramatic happens, 
all of us would fall on sleep and die. Well, all of us would die. And yet the Bible says there is more. When we talk of salvation, we have to understand when and how it happens. And that is how the rest, the other element of the promise comes in. That's where the land promise is. There cannot be a seed promise without a land promise. There cannot be people without some sense of where salvation is to be experienced. And the Bible rolls it out quite plainly for us, as we see in the final of those seven passages. Acts 28. Just see then where this takes us as the Apostle Paul reveals it for us. So here is Acts, in Acts 28 we have the Apostle Paul preaching in Rome. Verse 20. He called for his people, the Jews, and I called for you to see you and to speak with you because that for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. So just note that this is now whatever he's going to talk about now. It is the hope of Israel. Verse 23. When they had appointed him a day, there came many to him to his lodging to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. Now again, there's several things in that verse. The first is he opened his Hebrew scriptures from the law of Moses and from the prophets, and doubtless from the Psalms as well, and told them something. What was he preaching? The kingdom of God persuading them the kingdom of God, that's what he was talking about. It's no good talking about salvation without knowing where it happens and how, is it? And the Bible says it happens in the kingdom of God because it's a land promise, because the seeds have to be in the land. God's purpose is with the earth. He wants to fill the earth with people. People who know about God. People who are like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's his purpose. It says to fill the earth with his glory. It means full of people like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the kingdom of God is going to be like. Can you imagine living in a world full of people like the Lord Jesus Christ? That's his ultimate purpose. So we have a land promise, preaching the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus. But it doesn't stop there, does it? Because there's a seed promise concerning Jesus. This is what the preaching was about. Persuading them concerning Jesus. All of these elements of the land promise and the seed promise then were all there in, in the Hebrew Scriptures, in the Old Testament, in the law and in the prophets, as, as the Apostle Paul went through. And in actual fact, he's drawing on the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ in the period after he rose from the dead and he was with his disciples when he took them through this book, didn't he? He told them what it was all about. So the land promise and the seed promise is there together because, well, the seeds, the people, have to be planted in God's land. And it starts out with his people, the people of Israel, planted again in their land, God's land given to Abraham, the land of Israel. And it spreads throughout the earth so that all of the earth becomes full of his glory. Because, remember, Galatians 3 said, all nations were to take part in that blessing. And that is why verse 20 had talked about the hope of Israel. That's what it is at its heart. And what's more, we started off talking about the good news of Jesus and the kingdom of God. That's actually taken from, I'm not turning there, from Acts chapter 8, which says that this is what the gospel is, Acts 8 verse 12, doesn't it? It says this is the gospel that the apostles were preaching, the things concerning the kingdom of God, which is the land promise, and the name of Jesus Christ, which is the seed promise. The consistent teaching through Old and New Testaments in the mouth of Jesus and his apostles. That's the means by which God is going to fulfill his purpose. So it's time to finish off in Galatians chapter 3. And just as you turn there, let's just summarise what we've seen. Galatians chapter 3. 
we saw that the good news was preached to Abraham. And that's called the gospel, the good news, says Galatians chapter 3. All nations were going to be blessed in Abraham's seed. That was a seed promise. The land of Israel was promised to Abraham. That was a land promise. <coughs> Jesus was born to bring salvation. Through the seed of Abraham, he was going to bring salvation to all people, that there might be fruit for God from his seed, a seed promise. Jesus was born to rule from David's throne, said the angel to Mary. That was a land promise about a kingdom on the earth, a land promise. The blessing is seen in forgiveness of sins, we read in Acts chapter 3. And that was a seed promise, how people could be made right with God, just as he testified in Galatians. And the hope of Israel, which is about the work of Jesus in bringing salvation and the kingdom of God, was the confirmation of both of those elements coming together, the land promise and the seed promise. And that is the good news about Jesus and the kingdom of God. The gospel, the hope of Israel, the seed promise about Jesus, the land promise, the kingdom of God. And that is the simple teaching of the whole of the Bible, the Old Testament or the New Testament. It finds the same consistent pattern. And that is how the gospel was preached to Abraham, of course. Those two components were there, the land and the seed in what was shown to Abraham. And it's there. So let's finish off in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He says not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one. And to thy seed, which is Christ. So God has a purpose with the Jewish nation. His people, the many seeds that were promised to Abraham as the stars of the sky. And beyond that, to those faithful who joined his covenant promise of whatever nation. But he still has a purpose with that nation. But that isn't what verse 16 is talking about. He's saying there is one particular individual seed who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 26. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So who were the promises made to? First of all, Abraham. And Abraham's seed, who was Christ. And verse 27, as many as you have, have been baptised into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. So if you become Christ's seed... <coughs> then you too become part of the inheritors of those promises. The land promise and the seed promise can involve you too. And it has to because we read in Galatians that all nations were going to be the subject of blessing and to be made right with God. So there's Christ's seed and there's us. How do those things come together? How do we have a part in those promises? Well, as we often talk about here. It's all about baptism, baptism, isn't it? That's how we, who have no natural part in the things of the promises of God, can become into, can get into those promises by associating ourselves with the work of the Lord Jesus. When Christ returns then, the question is, will he recognise you as part of his seed? He's looking for those people who are prepared to believe what God has said, to seek his mercies, the part of the seed promise which was about people, to bring salvation, forgiveness, repentance, and that we might also inherit the land promise, to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, to be with his followers of all ages, not perfect people, but people who've recognised their need, sought forgiveness, and salvation in the work of the Lord Jesus, and that in that day he might recognise us.
as part of his seed. That's the good news about Jesus and the coming kingdom of God. And the scripture implores us to take careful note of what it's saying.